All right, guys, we are in chapter four. We're going, we're going to be looking at Greece and Iran um, from about 1000 to 30 BCE. This is a map of the Persian Empire. Uh, going to be discussing some of the, the different areas right here, but gives you a little bit of a mindset of where we are going. So let's look at <clears throat> ancient Iran first. We're going to look be looking at geography and resources. Iran's location, which is bounded by mountains, deserts, and the Persian Gulf, left it open to attack from Central Asian nomads. The fundamental topographical features included high mountains on the edges, salt deserts in the interior, and the sloping plateau uh, crossed, the mountain, crossed by mountain streams. Iran had limited natural resources, water was relatively scarce, and Iran's environment could support only a limited population. Because of the heat, irrigation networks had to use underground channels. Construction and maintenance of underground irrigation networks was labor-intensive and advanced under a strong central authority. Iran had mineral resources, copper, tin, iron, gold, and silver, and plentiful timber. So let's look at the rise of the Persian Empire. This is going to come back, uh, come back to play again when we discuss a little bit later on with the Greeks. Um, so the rise of the Persian Empire. The Median Kingdom in the northwestern Iran helped to destroy the Assyrian Empire in the late 7th century BCE. The Persian Achaemenid, which I butchered, um, that is spelled A-C-H-A-E-M-E-N-I-D, dynasty, was related to the Median court by marriage, and in 550 BCE, Cyrus overthrew the Median king and built a larger Persian empire that included Medes and Persians. The Persian empire was built up by a series of three kings, Cyrus, Cambyses, and Darius I, a distant relative of the royal family. Cyrus captured the kingdom of Lydia in 546, thus bringing all of the Anatolia under his control, and later took Mesopotamia in 539. Cambius, uh, Cambius defeated Egypt and sent expeditions to Nubia and Libya. Under Darius I, the role of the Medes declined as the Persians asserted greater dominance. Asserted greater dominance. Darius extended the empire east to the Indus Valley and west to the European Thrace. So then let's look at the imperial organization, how the government was set up. From Darius on, the empire was divided into 20 provinces. The satrap who was related or connected to the royal court, which administered each province. The position of satrap tended to become hereditary. Satraps in distant provinces had considerable autonomy. The provinces were required to pay an annual tribute. The central government tended to hoard so much gold and silver that these metals became scarce and more expensive. The provinces were crossed by a system of well-maintained roads, that converge on the capital city of Susa, which is in southwestern Iran, S-U-S-A. And garrisons were installed in key locations. The Persian kings developed a style of king kingship in which they had in which they held aloof and majestic <clears throat> masters of all subjects and nobles. Kings owned and administered vast tracts of king's land in areas around the empire. Kings acted as lawgivers, but allowed each of their subject peoples to live in accordance to their own traditions. Kings managed the central administration in the capital Susa, and also performed the ceremonies of the per Persopolis in the Persian homeland. Ambassadors to the capital from the far reaches of the empire might have been away from home for a year or more to conduct their business. Then we have to move down to ideology and religions. So we're going to get into Zoroastrianism a little bit. The major religion of the Persian Empire was Zoroastrianism. The origins of the religion are unclear. Traditions uh, ascribes <clears throat> the Gathas, the hymn of the Zoroastrians, and the Zoaster, who lived sometime between 1700 and 500 BCE. Zoro Zoroastrianism, if I can pronounce it right, uh, posited the existence of a dualistic universe in which the god of good, which was Arumazada, which is A-H-U-R-A-M-A-Z-D-A, -A -A, was locked in an epic struggle between the good 
between the god of e evil, Angra, A-N-G-R-A. Zoroastrianism, dualism, may have had influence on Judaism and thus on Christianity. Darius combined the moral philosophy of Zoroastrianism with political ideology to claim that forming the empire of scattered people was his divinely driven mission. So let's look at the rise of the Greeks. We're going to talk about geography and resources first. Greece is part of the Mediterranean ecological zone, which is an area all the which an area in which all the various lands have similar climate, similar seasons, and similar crops. This characteristics of the Mediterranean zone is highly conducive to migration and transfer of crops, technology, and trade. The Greek culture its area itself included the Greek mainland and the islands in the western edge of Anatolia. The areas in inhabited by the Greeks relied entirely on rainfall, having no water so resources sufficient for irrigation. Limited water and limited thin arable soil meant that the area could not support large populations. Greece had few metal resources and little timber, but it did have plentiful harbors. So the emergence of the polis, the dark age that followed the Mycenaean period, lasted from 1150 to 800 BCE. The Dark Age ended when contact and trade with the Mediterranean lands were reestablished. The Phoenicians played an important role and provided an alphabetic writing system. This began the Archaic Period, which happened from 800 to 480 BCE. One of the notable features of the Archaic Period was explosive population growth. Possible causes of this population growth include the shift from pastoral to an agricultural economy, and importa importation of foods and raw materials. The effects of population growth included urbanization, specialization, and the development of the polis. The polis, or city-state, was an urban center and its rural territory. Characteristics featured of the polis included the Acropolis and Agora, fortified walls, and public buildings. There was no sharp distinction between urban and rural areas or their inhabitants. There were frequent wars, frequent wars between the city-states. The Greeks developed a style of warfare that used hoplites, a close formation of heavily armored infantry who would try to break the enemy's line of defense. The soldiers were mostly farmer citizens who served for short periods of time when called. When population growth outstripped available resources, the Greeks sent excess population to colonize other areas in the Mediterranean and Black Sea. Colonization brought the Greeks into closer contact with other peoples. Colonization introduced the Greeks to new ideas, but also sharpened their sense of Greek identity. One of the most significant new developments of this period is the invention of coins in Lydia in the sixth, early 6th century BCE. Increasing prosperity and the growth of the middle class in the archaic Greek society led to the emergence in the mid-7th and 6th centuries BCE of one-man rule by tyrants who reduced the power of traditional elites. The tyrants were eventually ejected, and the government developed in one of two directions, an oligarchy or a democracy. An oligarchy meaning an elite land-owning uh, rich class controlling the government, or democracy meaning everybody got a say. Greek religion involved the worship of of anthropomorphic sky gods, many which represented the forces of nature. These gods were worshipped at state ceremonies. Sacrifice was a central part of religious practice and helped to create a sense of community. In addition, the Greeks sought advice from oracles, such as the Oracle of Apollo and Delphi, and also revered female fertility deities. So then we're going to look at some new in intellectual currents. During the Archaic period, Greeks began to develop the concepts of individualism and humanism. The pre-Socratic philosopher of the Archaic period also began to question traditional Greek religion. Instead, they tried to explain rationally why the world was created, what it's made of, and why it changes. In the late 6th century BCE, a group of lipographers in Ionia began to gather information on the various peoples of the Mediterranean, the founding of important cities, and the background of important Greek families. This method of investigation and research, Historia, was adopted by Herodotus in his histories, which this is why we are, I have a job today. Herodotus went beyond the simple collection and recording of information to offer explanation as to why the Greeks and the Persians had gone to war. In doing so, Herodotus 
invented the discipline of history in its modern sense. And this is where you get Athens and Sparta, which are two of the major city-states. Sparta was a polis located in the Peloponnese in southern Greece. To assure its supply of food, Sparta took over more fertile land in Messenia and enslaved the Messenians. Fear of an uprising of their Messenian slaves inspired the Spartans to create a severely aesthetic and highly militarized society in which all Spartan males trained for the army and devoted their lives to the needs of the state. Athens had the unusually large hinterland, Attica, that supported a population of 300,000 in the 5th century BCE. Athens went through a period of rule by tyrants in the 6th century BCE. In the late 6th century and early to mid 5th centuries, Athens rejected or ejected the tyrant family and developed a democracy. Pericles completed the transition to democracy in the 460s to 450s. Popular organs of government included the assembly, the council of 500, and the people's courts, all things that had influences on our own society. So this is the map of ancient Greece. So look at all the islands there. So they didn't have much natural resources, but they did have tons of harbors. And if you had harbors, you were going to be wealthy. All right, so let's look at the struggles of Persia and Greece, some early encounters. In 499 BCE, the Greek cities of Anatolia, aided by Eritrea, which is... E-R-E-T-R-I-A, and Athens, staged a five-year revolt against Persian rule. This led to the Persian Wars, two Persian attacks on Greece. The first Persian War, the generals of Darius I captured Eritrea and attacked Athens. The attack on Athens was foiled when Athenian forces defeated the Persians at Marathon, which is one of the major, most popular battles of the ancient world. The second Persian War, Xerxes, led an army and a fleet against the Greeks in 480 BCE. Many Greek city-states submitted. In southern Greece, Sparta organized a, Hellen a Hellenic League, an alliance of city-states that defeated the Persians. Then the Greeks, led by Athens, was organized into the Delian League in 477 BCE, which went on the offensive and drove the Persians out of most of the eastern Mediterranean, except Cyprus. So the height of the Athenian power. The classical period of Greek history, 480 to 323, was marked by a dominant role of Athens, which subordinated the other states of the Delian League and became an imperial power. The Athenian power was based on the Athenian navy. The key strengths of the Athenian navy were new, uh, were technological innovation and the use of lower class men as rowers. The major technological innovation was the development of the tri uh, triamine, which is T-R-I-R-E-M-E, -E, which is a fast, maneuverable 170-oar boat. The use of the lower-class rowers meant further democratization of the Athenian society because these men, realizing their importance, demanded that they get full rights citizenship. Athens used its power to carry out prof profitable trade and extract, an, extract an annual tribute from subject states. The wealth of the empire made it possible for Athens to construct impressive public works, put on grand festivals, and support the development of the arts and sciences. The two most uh, influential philosophers of the classical period were Socrates and Plato. Socrates turned the focus of philosophy to ethics, probed the precise meaning of words, and created a Socratic method of questioning and of, to, of question and answer. He was tried on charges of corrupting the youth and not believing in the gods of the city and was sentenced to death. Socrates' disciple Plato wrote dialogues exploring concepts such as justice, excellence, and wisdom. Plato taught that the world as we see it is a pale reflection of a higher ideal reality. Plato's intellectual activity is representative of the transition from an oral to a written culture. Plato read and wrote books, and he founded a school which was called the Academy. So then we got to look at the inequality of classical Greece. The Athenian democracy was very limited in its, in its scope. Only free adult males who uh, participated in Athenian democracy. They accounted for about 10 to 15 percent of the total population. Women, children, slaves, foreigners did not have rights of citizens. Slaves were mostly foreign, accounted for one third of the population, and were regarded as property. The average Athenian family owned one or more slaves who were treated like domestic servants. Slaves provided male citizens with the leisure for political activity. 
The position of women varied from Greek communities. In Sparta, women were relatively free and outspoken, although they did have to train almost every day in order to be worthy and have their bodies ready to um, give birth to adults or to soldiers. Uh, in Athens, women were con- more confined and oppressed. Athenian marriages were are were unequal. Arranged unions of younger women to older men. The duties of the wife were produ- were to produce and raise children, especially sons, to weave cloth and to cook and clean. Because there were no meaningful relations between men and women, men sought intellectual and emotional companionship from other men. This gave rise to the common pattern of bisexuality, in which older men engaged in extended social, intellectual, and sexual relationships with younger men. So that's kind of a taboo topic, but that is, it, it was common in the Greek society. So then you have the failure of the city-states and the triumph of the Macedonians. Imperial Athens aroused the resentment of other Greek city-states, which led in 431 to the Peloponnesian War, which is a conflict between the alliance systems of Athens and Sparta. Sparta, with a navy paid for by the Persians, finally defeated Athens in 404 BCE. Sparta's arrogance then uh, inspired the opposition of other Greek city-states. This internal conflict among the Greeks gave Persia the opportunity to recover its territory in Western Asia, including Greek communities of the Anatolian coast. As the Greek city-states declined in power, the backward northern Greek kingdom of Macedonia developed into a great military power. King Philip of Macedonia strengthened his army by equipping his soldiers with longer spears, using both cavalry and infantry forces, and developing new siege equipment, including catapults. Philip's son, the heir Alexander the Great, invaded Persia in 336 BCE and defeated the forces of the Persian Empire. Alexander, who conquered as far as Pakistan, built his own empire in which he maintained the administrative apparatus of the Persian Empire, used Persian officials as well as Greeks and Macedonians, and began to present himself as the successor of the Persian king. So this is a replica of the Greek trimene. So let's look at the Hellenistic kingdoms next. After Alexander died, his empire broke into three kingdoms, each ruled by a Macedonian uh, dynasty. The period of time covered by these kingdoms is called the Hellenistic Age. The Seleucid kingdom included the core area of Mesopotamia, Syria, parts of Anatolia, and the peripheral possessions including Iran and Indus Valley. The peripheral areas were entirely lost by the 2nd century BCE. The Seleucids maintained a Persian-style administrative system and continued Alexander's policy of establishing new Greek cities, Greek-style city, cities. But the Ptolemies ruled Egypt and sometimes Palestine. They took over the highly centralized and well-controlled Egyptian administrative uh, and taxation systems. The Ptolemies made Alexandria their capital and actively encouraged Greek immigration. The Ptolemies did not build other Greek-style cities. Their lifestyle and language of the majority of, of the Egyptian population did not change significantly. Native Egyptians did, however, resent Greek rule, and uprisings were increasingly common from early 2nd century BCE. The Antigonids ruled Macedonia and the adjacent parts of Greece. The Spartans, however, as well as new confederations of city-states, resisted Macedonian rule, while Athens remained neutral. Alexandria was the greatest city of the the Hellenistic Age. With a population of nearly half a million, the (laughs) Mausoleum of Alexandria, the library, and the museum. Alexandria was a political center and a great center of learning and a major trading city. Alexandria was a Greek city. Its Greek residents enjoyed uh, citizenship and took part in institutions of government, which was the assembly and the council. Public baths, theaters, gymnasiums offered residents all the amenities of Greek life. The city also had a significant Jewish population that dominated two of the five residential districts of the city. Hellenization included intermarriage between Greeks and non-Greeks, the spread of Greek language and lifestyle, and the synthesis of indigenous Greek culture. So this is the area that we're talking about, the Hellenistic civilization. So when that broke apart, these were the areas that ended up breaking. This is how they broke into their different uh, pieces. So make sure you keep a mental picture of this or know that this is here. 
All right, guys, that is it. If you have any questions over chapter four, 